Good afternoon and evening, and welcome to another edition of the QPR podcast. We've got two guests this week. We've, we're going to start off with Alex Carroll, who is a development officer and academy director. Is that right, Alex, at QPR? That's correct, Paul, yeah. And um, welcome to the podcast. This is your first time. It's not at all scary, Alex. We're just going to ask you some questions, and hopefully you can fill us in on your background and what you're doing at QPR and this new thing with the B team, youth team, and the way to, to accelerate kids into the first team, hopefully. Charlie Wise is back, who is a lovely fella. And um, a lot of people have been seeing him at matches recently and getting selfies with him. I like that, Charlie. You're getting a whole new career for yourself. I've noticed <laughs> this. No one ever asked for a selfie with me, because I think they think I'm going to blow the camera up in my face. But um, welcome, Charlie. Good to see you again, big man. Thank you very much. Nice to... Uh, now I'm looking forward to... We've got, some, we've got some good topics and some good guests this evening. So looking forward to talking QPR and finding a bit more about this B team as well. Exactly. And then... We've also got the Z man, as I'm going to call him. Is that all right, big man? Absolutely fine, yeah. yeah. Oh, you call yourself a Z man. We say Z and no now, and it's a lot easier. That's, um, it's based on the name. I promise it's not based on the letter. Uh, my, American, <laughs> my American missus gives me a lot of stick about it, and she like, insists on calling me Z just to try and make a point or something, and it doesn't go down very well. But, um, yeah, no, really, really delighted to be here with you guys. Um, obviously, pleasure to meet you, Alex, and, and obviously yourself and... Yourself, Charlie, and Paul as well. Um, yeah, really delighted. As it's your first time and you're a fan, just introduce yourself, big man, and how you got into QPR. Yeah, sure. So uh, Charlie sort of like briefly touched on it, but um, sort of uh, started getting to games as a kid. Uh, my mate Josh, who I think has been on the podcast before, started taking taking me probably when I was anywhere between sort of like 10 and 12. Um, saw a lot of sort of 1-0 losses and stuff at home and things like that. And then... Um, sort of started getting involved a little bit more in the promotion season of 2010, 2011. Um, I remember distinctly sort of the, I thought almost like the turning point was the, I don't know whether you guys remember this game, but um, the Cardiff at home game in November when Adele mm -hmm. got inside from the right yeah. side, took it on his left and pinged it in the corner. And I, I just, just that day, that atmosphere, it just, it was so electric and it was, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it was like a turning point for me where I was just like, you know what, I want to be part, part of this club and, like forever, do you know what I mean? Not just like, I just don't want to just go here every now and again. And so it sounds super cheesy, but I think um, that was probably the, the turning point for me. Um, and yeah, since then I've been uh, a fan and uh, pretty pretty loyal as well. We took a, had a season ticket um, in the 11-12 season and then in the Premier League season following that. And then after that, a bit trickier, I tried to, I think I went to pretty much every home game in the season. We got promoted in 2013, 14, and then going to uni made it a bit more tricky. But um, yeah, no, it was, um, that's sort of my journey. <laughs> it wasn't very much in a nutshell, a nutshell but um, yeah. No, it's good because the reason why I got you on is because you will come on to later on. We're going to speak to Alex first. But you kind of changed my thinking of, of new fans. I'm not just saying that because you're on. We had a long chat in the pub about this. Yeah, and then yeah. you come to the podcast about this. So it's, we'll, we'll come on to that later on. Yeah. Alex. Welcome, 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 and it's so nice to see you. And I'm, I must admit, you've got very well groomed for the podcast. I feel like I've, I've severely underdressed um, in, in Barnet here, but you know what it's like. So tell us your journey into QPR, fella, and what what, what the, the plans are, first of all, with yourself, and then we'll go on to the B Charlie can go on to the B team and, and go on from there. Yeah, no, no, sounds good. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, I've listened to a number of the podcasts and, and really enjoy them, so I'm, I'm pleased to be yeah. taking, taking part in one. Hopefully, I don't regret that afterwards. But um, no, they don't I've, be uh, <laughs> um, I've been uh, I've been at QPR for, for seven and a half years now. So joined in 2014, um, came across as head of operations in the academy, and then I've moved around a couple of times, sort of internally, and uh, was made academy director. Um, at the start of 2018, so I've been doing that for sort of just over three years now. Um, really, really love working for the club. It's um, It's got a feel to it. It, it. it really is one of the clubs that kind of sticks to what it says it is, rather than just having kind of things painted on the walls about the fact there's a community feel to the club. Um, you do feel that when you walk in the door every day. Um, there's a, a connection across the staff. Um, it's a great place to work. And yeah, it's, a, it's also an exciting place to work at the moment. Obviously, the first team have made a really good start to the season, really positive signs there. Um, and we're also really pleased with the progress that we've made in the academy 
um, and the number of sort of young players making an impression um, in our team, um, also being sold on as well, which has obviously got to be a big part of our, our business plan. So, yeah, positive outlook at the moment working for our club. Charlie. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's fantastic. It is great to hear um, so your progression as well, the club and, and climbing to academy director. So well, I want to get into kind of this B team. I think it's quite an intriguing matter. It's quite topical in the, world, the sort of current um, world of football. I just, want, I just want to start off in terms of, of course, there's this perspective that, um, you know, it helps uh, path players, younger players in the academy to the first team and I know, and it sounds great, but I'm kind of intrigued as to what exactly changes. So hypothetically, on the Friday when you yeah, say your last day is an under 23 sort of set up and structure and you started on the Monday as a B team, what exactly changes from those two sort of structures from an outside or inside perspective? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I think um, B team means something very different from club to club. Um, and I think it's quite uh, important to try and address what it isn't at our club. So we haven't created a squad we're not looking to create a squad that's going to be competitive um, and go out and we're not going to deem success by going and beating non-league sides or, or beating other b teams that's not why we've developed this what we've done is we've created a fixture program and the fixture program is meant to supplement the first team and also the under 23s so what we do is we look at we you know we plan sort of in little periods at a time and we think, right, what do those group of players need? So, for example, um, there's going to be a game coming up in the next couple of weeks, which will be um, announced probably tomorrow, which is going to be against Hampton and Richmond. And we've picked that because it's in a week where it's going to be in the international week. So the first team are going to have some players that maybe haven't accrued enough minutes in, in the first team and need to keep them ready for when they're called upon in the first team. And we've then got players that are at the sort of the top end of our academy who we're trying to provide a different experience for. So the under 23s league is very unpredictable. So we mm. give an example next week, we've got two games um, against two, two different clubs, obviously um, we could go to one game and we could be playing up against essentially what would be an under 18s, under 19s combined 11. The following game, we could be playing up against half a first team and half a 23s. You're never going to know. It's incredibly unpredictable. And therefore, it's very challenging for us to think, right, we're planning individual programmes for players. We don't know where the consistency lies. So for us to be able to control that a little bit better and to create a link with the first team is something that we've thought about. And, and that's why we're trying to confirm really with everyone that it's, it's a fixture programme as opposed to creating another squad. We're not creating another level. You don't have to graduate from the 23s into the B team and then into the first team. It could be that there's, when we've got an under-18 player at the moment, Sinclair Armstrong, who's excelling, he's, he's doing very well, and, and he's been playing in the B team, and, and obviously he's starting to kind of be on people's radar now. So the fact that he's 18 doesn't mean to say he can't be a B team player, in inverted commas, if that makes sense. Right. No, that's a good idea. I, I like the sound of it, to be fair. Sorry, Charlie. No, 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 you go on, you go on, Paul, and I'll come I'll <laughs> It's a weird one because years and years and years I've had this thing and I blame the big clubs, Alex. I can't, obviously didn't expect you to comment because you work for the club. Um, the way that kids are just, you know, basically in the door um, at mass, loaned out and then thrown in the scrap heap and stuff like that. Is QPR going to try and, and just develop X amount of players to get the best out of them and, and, and try and stop this? There's a program in Panorama last night about it, funny enough. Um, the, the, and it is hard because these kids have promised everything and then tossed one side. Are we trying to pick up some of them players and then develop them, as in the case of Eze, obviously being more famous, but the same you, you could have said for um, Joe and so on. Is, is that the idea? So that's definitely, yeah, that, that's definitely a part of it. Um, obviously, we, we want to retain as many players as we can through the age groups, but it, it's just not possible to keep everyone. Um, and we've been, yeah, we've always been, you know, fairly active looking at those players in that, I guess, sort of 17 to 19 bracket who have fallen away from other clubs. And we've looked and felt that there's potential there and that we've got expertise in the building that can allow them to flourish. Um, but I think also just to your point, and, and obviously I watched the Panorama sort of uh, the programme as well. Um, oh, we, we, we are a club that um, is very open and honest with our players. So we promote 
development both on and off the pitch. And I'm not coming on here and trying to sort of just, as I say, almost going back to that community feel, going to regurgitate something that's on the wall and then it's not something that we adhere to. We are genuinely looking, you know, looking at these young people and thinking, even if you look in our under 23 squad, we know and we're honest with them. We sat, I sat in a room with them the other day and said, unfortunately, you're not all going to play for QPR. That would be our absolute dream. But the class of 92 does not get replicated anywhere. That is, a, that is almost a one-off. So for us, we have to be open and transparent with the players. Of course, we want them to make the transition to our first team. But if it isn't going to be for QPR, then how are we supporting them to become players in other clubs? Or if it's not going to be football, how are we supporting them in their lives? So we're as proud of, I don't know, Aussie being in the first team squad and playing fairly regularly as we are of uh, Jimmy Farmy, who was a player that came through a lot of age groups at our academy, got to a point where he had a decision to make about education or football. And we supported his decision around education and he's now at Harvard University in the, in the United States. So we're looking at that with as much pride as, as Aussie playing last night. Um, and, and we promote that actively with all of our players. And our head of education, Stephen, has done a fantastic job in providing a range of opportunities for them to explore in their lives. So we've got members of our 23 squad at the moment who are doing B licenses in coaching. We've got people doing personal training certificates. We've got people doing apprenticeships in leadership. We've got business degrees being undertaken as well. So we're trying to make sure that if that point comes where they're not going to be QPR players, they've got options in their life and we can hold ourselves to account to say we help them get to that position and hopefully be successful in something if it's not going to be football. Yeah. I think, I think that's... Uh, like I think, um, yeah, no, go on, go on. I'm almost quite surprised that um, I guess because you don't really hear too much about it, but the fact that there is that sort of pathway that if there some someone does fall down the wayside, that then you know and and doesn't actually manage to get first team experience, then they have that sort of pathway you know panned out for them, whether it's through you know further education or I guess like apprenticeships and stuff like that. Um, I was just gonna I sort of touch on kind of what Paul said about sort of the fact that we've sort of picked up Eze and stuff like that. Out of interest, and ho hopefully the, the listeners will find this interesting as well, but how would you describe the, the process of getting them through the door, what might be looked looked for, and then I guess the, the transition of picking them up and sort of then trying to weave them into the first team gradually? I think it depends. There's going to be some times where we've got a, we've got a scout network, uh, obviously that look at look at um, academy age groups and are then aware and keeping contact with with people at clubs and aware of who's going to potentially be coming available. And we look at those players and think, right, we've identified that one as as one that we feel would suit us and we think we can help them, or it might be a, yeah, just could be a recommendation. Um, the process through which they come in. Um, obviously, a lot of the times, if you're talking about this bracket, it's dealt with through agents or, or clubs if they're with other clubs and we know they're going to be coming available. Um, and then it's as simple as arranging a trial period. And um, those trial periods can vary. Um, you know, a beer -A's trial period was memorable because he came in. People knew about a beer -A on the circuit anyway. He, he, he played against us a number of times for Millwall. Um, but he came to us and he, we went to Lillishaw for a pre-season training camp. And I remember um, Paul Hall and Andy Impey were taking the session and uh, myself and Chris Ramsey were just having a chat with them after sort of day one. And it's normally, you know, quite a light session the first day of the camp. And they came off and just said, we're going to sign this kid. There's just, there's no, you know, he's, he's, he's someone that we see something in. We think there's, there's, there's sort of flair and there's, there's things that we can work with. Obviously, he's probably going to need some help in other areas of his game. But very rarely is it day one when the coaches come off and say, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna need to sign this player. It's often yeah, he's gonna find he needs to find his feet. Give him some time, week one, week two, whatever it might be, playing some games. And the and the trial lengths can can vary. Sometimes in the under 18s you've got the option to have them for up to to eight weeks, but you know decisions are sometimes come too early than that. Um, and it's uh, it, it's a yeah pretty smooth process to be honest. Um, and and as I say, we've been pleased with those that have come from other, we've, the ones that we've picked up from other clubs um, that we've been able to, to polish, if you like, and get them, get them ready at an accelerated rate for the first thing. In, in that situation, though, is there some sort of like non-compete or something that, you know, you can put in place so that, you know, if Iberi is really impressed and he, he almost feels that confidence and he feels like he could go elsewhere, he could like 
then speak to his agent and then get potentially a trial with another club? Is there like a set amount of time that he's like exclusively ours if we want him or how does it work in that way? There is in terms of how you how you'd formally register a trialist. So um, if, for example, Bire comes in at the age of 18 and then he's effectively under 23's trialist, um, you register those players on a, uh, a, they call it a PDL 5 form, not going to get too technical. But then that that kind of does then mean that the player is with you until you've cancelled that trial period. Okay. If if they want to go to another club, then we would have to discuss with the other club and say, look, this player's not gonna not gonna work out here. But here's a here's a sort of reference and 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 sort of let them go on and look at other opportunities. Sounds like sort of any other job in that respect of a reference and stuff like that as well. Yeah, I think I think that you know that the the football community is pretty tight knit as well. You know, people know. It, you know, we, we know people at most clubs and um, it's a two-way street, right? So if we've got players that uh, it's not working out for our place, but we feel may suit another environment, we're the first to pick the phone up and recommend them as well. So you build up those relationships with clubs and then you get, you know, you get those, that you get kind of connections that you feel strongly uh, that you can trust and then you're you're willing to sort of bring the, bring the players in. Darling, this one... Yeah, I just want to come in and just kind of there's another point I want to just sort of discuss of what you kind of spoke about on the, the sort of the B team structure. Um, what is quite interesting, I do I do completely agree in terms of the under 23 football. It is very unpredictable, it's sort of quite limited and it's all very up in the air of like you say, who turns up. I'm sure, you know, I'm no person to speak on this, of course, uh, you know, inside and out. But one thing I'm kind of intrigued about is the fact that um, and I don't like to bring these these lot up up an awful lot, but Brentford they I'm not sure I don't know the ins and outs of this, but I've read that they they scrapped the whole academy and adopted this all out B team style. But then you've got teams like us who, and I think it's Southampton as well who have implemented the B team alongside the academy. And I'm just kind of thinking like, you know, we're trying to you like you say you're trying to limit that sort of unpredictability. But then how will that be when say you want to play? Brentford's B team in, in, a, in a B team clash, but then, or for example, you, you play in another side that's got an academy with an under 23 squad and a B team. Does that, that also then kind of brings in more unpredictability from our perspective. So just kind of intrigued to see how you feel about that and also why you opted for a B team with the academy and not the other model, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no problem. Um, so there's a couple of examples of clubs that have gone down the Brentford route, if you like. Um, so uh, Huddersfield is similar. They uh, they disbanded everything from sort of their 17s down. Um, so those are the sort of the two the two standout clubs. I think that Salford had looked at it at one point, Salford City, but then I think they ended up kind of sticking with what they had in terms of their academy. Um, we, we know Brentford's B team very well. We know the level of that squad. We've played them uh, a number of times over the past sort of three or four years. Um, it's always a very, very good game. So we, we, we know that when we organise a game against Brentford, that's going to be a strong game. They've recruited players. It's cost them quite a lot of money to recruit players into that group. Um, so we know about them and we're always confident that we're going to get a competitive match. So that, that we deem as a, a, a really high level sort of development game, if you like. Um, in terms of your question about, you know, why did we go down the route of, not disbanding the academy and keeping everything below. Um, we feel that, that the academy can provide a return. So what we would love to get to, and you've seen other clubs who are great examples. I don't want to bring uh, rival clubs into it, but there are some other clubs in London, shall we say, where you're seeing um, that the academy is now being provided, academy players are now being provided with opportunities in their first team. And you'll notice that lots of those players have come from the very youngest age groups of the academy. What we want to get to is we want to become, I think I said this in, in sort of a piece I did recently, we want to compete with those academies to become more of a first pick for young players in London. So we want to be able to show that there's a clear pathway through to our first team, as well as going back to the point I made earlier, providing an environment that looks after the kids and also helps them with their lives, you know, helps to, to you know, produce young men that can go out and be successful in the world. So that we're produ you know, we're able to confidently say to parents when we're trying to attract young young players to our club that they're coming into a safe environment, they're going to be developed both on and off the pitch. And by the way, there's a really good pathway to our first team. So we we feel that there is a is a huge value in operating the academy spectrum the whole way through. And as I say, we're now working towards trying to become 
competition for those academies, which I think in, in the past few years has been really difficult. It's been really tough for us to hold on to our best players and we're trying to change that. Just, just, just sort of lastly, just to round it, uh, just round it off. What, what exact element of implementing this B team do you feel sort of furthers this and eases this pathway more than sort of the under twenty three route that we had before? Is it the fact of, like you said, where it could be bridging the route more in the fact of where they're playing with more of the first team players instead of was it the limit of three over 23 year olds yeah. for under 23 fixtures is it that element that you know sort of ease them in terms of they're playing with the first squad more or is it the standard of football that, that kind of uh further promotes their, their their personal growth or yeah what is it kind of that that you think it's like encourages so, that so yeah charlie agree with both of those points they're really valid so yes playing alongside as many first team players as possible is really important playing in front of uh crowds is important in front of qpr fans and trying to build an atmosphere um playing against men is also very important competitive men's side so that mm. that for me is is uh so young players there's a lot the way in which young players are treated sometimes is, is that there can always be an ex, not not saying in our club I'm talking about the game in general the first label that is always thrown at a young player is can they hack it in a men's environment so what we want to do is we want to give those young players an opportunity to prove that they can do that whilst in the academy as well so we're developing that side of them there will be times where we think it is best for a young player to go on loan as well and to be sort of fully integrated into into a men's side and to be there staying away from home and you know basically going through the social experience as well as going through the sort of the, the technical experience of being on loan so for example mm. we've got a 19 year old forward at south end at the moment called hamzad Kagbo. so another prospect at the club but we felt for him it was going to be really important for him to actually go into a men, go into south end's dressing room and be there for a period of time really understand what winning and losing is like in a competitive environment i'm sure the players in their dressing room will let him know when he's not holding up to his end of the bargain. So that we felt for him as an individual, that was the best plan. For others at the moment, there's players that are playing in the 23s and the B team and then sort of training at, at times with the first team where it makes more sense, we feel, for our kind of individual input into their coaching and development on a day-to-day -day basis at QPR is vital. So we, we, we look at them case by case and that's why you'll still see that there'll be a sprinkling of players that go out alone, but there may be others that, that stick around and, and, and as I say, play in that competitive environment and to be honest, prove the doubt is wrong. No, uh, I think it I think it is a I think it is a great move. Sorry, I just quickly round off. I don't want it to come across as being quite critical. I'm just very genuinely very intrigued of, as to how sort of it all runs off the changes from it. But as long as you guys don't start shouting about like Pep Guardiola and saying that B team should be in the in the football league, then, then we're all good. <laughs> Not <laughs> at no, all. No, no, no. I think I think I think it's a great initiative. And I think, you know, under 23 football has always been a bit of, like you say, a, a grey area in terms of you know, it is such an important platform and an important and sort of a critical stage of young players' careers in terms of will they make that gap or not? And if the platform's not right, then you could lose out on some big talent. So no, I think it's great that QPR acting in this area and I think it hopefully will reap the benefits in the future. Before we let you go, Alex, um first of all, thanks for coming on. Seriously, I appreciate it. And I think people will be fascinated by this. And I think we're gonna to have to get you on a couple of times throughout the season to update us, if you don't mind, on the progress of, of people. So we can familiar with eyes as cells. One question I wanted to ask before you go, how important are results for the youth team, the under 23s and the B team? Because sometimes youth team results haven't been great of late. And I'm not being critical, I'm just being honest by saying that. Um, are they vitally important or is it just to give people game time? So, um, yeah, I got, asked the, I got asked about this the other day as well. I think the first thing to, to state, really, just to make the position clear, because the way in which we, uh, I guess, promote our development philosophy, I think can sometimes be misconstrued that we, we don't care about losing, because that is not true. We never send a team out. None of our coaching staff and support staff ever go out and think we're going to accept losing today, not at all. We had a 23s game yesterday. Uh, against Coventry and we were disappointed coming away from that game having lost it because we felt we dominated large periods and created chances so the results are not the be all and end all for us we want to win games but we will deem success on the transition of players from the academy into our first team 
So the the under twenty three side that Abire, Ilias, Ozzy, Seni, uh, you know those guys were playing in did not win every week. But the fact that the managers were coming to watch and say, right, actually, we think that this player could potentially be ready, and then have a conversation with Chris Hawley Imps and look at the game plan for that day and try and expose that player to be able to show what they can do to be in a position where they can confidently say, right, actually, we've seen Aussie defend 1v1 loads in that game because we, you know, we, we allowed the winger to stay high and we, we put pressure on Aussie to defend like that. And then to be in a position where we're going, right, actually, now he's, he's stepped up to the first team. We're going to look back on that and we're not going to think about the under-23s game that was at Harlington on the 4th of January 2018 and we lost it. <laughs> but we never, ever want to go into a game and and accept losing. We, we want to win every game that we go into, but the result on a Saturday for the first team is is vitally important, but not as important in development football. Alex, I cannot thank you enough for coming on. And people can make up their own minds judging throughout the season and see what happens, but as a very good point about the players that have come through to um, Ozzy um, and then obviously Eze, who's now left, and, and so on. And people kind of forget that, so it's maybe more about the bigger picture at times rather than to our 19 minutes on that Saturday because we are seeing some good fruits of things. Um, but it would be nice to win a few more youth FA Cup matches from a personal point of view because it's, it's, it for me, the more older supporters see these youngsters, the more they can relate to them. Do you know what I mean, Alex? So yeah. the more they see it, the more they say, ah, I remember your man. I remember this young lad and I'll take an interest in the career even when they leave QPR. So that'll be good to see. But thank you so much for coming on. I cannot thank you enough again and we'll speak to you in a few more months, Alex. Yeah, pleasure, guys. Have a Thank good one. Thank Alex. Massively we'll appreciate that. Soon. Cheers. No, see you later. We've, we've, we've got a second guest in the podcast who should be here now. Ah, oh, I can see him. There's lovely kitchen. <laughs> um, we've got... I don't know if you're going to know this fella. I mean, there was a game last night against Everton and um, this fella scored the winning <laughs> penalty and it was unexpected and yet beautiful at the same time. James, Jimmy, Don, welcome to the QPR podcast, fella. How are you? Thank you for having me. Very exciting. I've heard great things. <laughs> about the podcast or just about um, this? And just... See, when people say that, it worries me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, no. just <laughs> it's just a general statement. Good man. No deep meaning. I like that. It's a very simple podcast for a very simple host, i.e. me. Right. Don't be complicated. Now... I believe that you're from uh, Dundalk. Is that right? I, I researched. I'm in. <laughs> I'm <thinking it> well. <laughs> yep, right. Now, see, I'm from Belfast. I'm not playing Vinny Bingo here. And do the worst thing about being from Belfast. People always tell you about the Titanic and they tell you about the Troubles and the most bombed hotel in Europe like you never knew. What? Tell us a wee bit about Dundalk and why it's famous. It's probably famous for being um, close to the border uh, between the Northern Republic of Ireland. It's maybe, I mean, it's not very famous at all. In most recent years, probably the football team. Um, yes. Probably the football team. They've been brilliant. They've excelled um through Stephen Kenny, especially when, when he was manager of Dundalk, he's is is Ireland manager now, they excelled in Europe. They had they, they made a name for themselves that way. They had a few, um, they had a, they had one or two good European runs and they won the league and so on. So that's probably in most recent years why you may, why people may have heard of Dundalk. Other than that, I can't think of many more reasons. It's actually quite, <laughs> it, it, non- it's a beautiful place, actually. I have been, and it's an amazing countryside place. If you want to go and chill for a wee while, Dundalk is a great holiday destination, in my humble opinion. Also, one of my first football heroes came from Dundalk. My Irish team's Glen Thorne. Don't know if you've heard of them. Yeah, They're not yeah, very good. Yeah. And there's a fella called Dermot Keeley who played for Glen Thorne, who was a who was a bit of a legend at Dundalk as well. Yeah. And he was one of my my heroes. But enough of that. Enough about Ireland. But it's great to have another person. Who can understand me? I can talk without having to slow me words down. As fast talk as me you through... Exactly, big man. Talk me through last night because you look like you're on planet flipping. I know Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. You've gone past them all at the end of that match. You were buzzing, big man. Talk, talk us through it. 
Well, I I had my um, I flew my mum over the uh, of the morning of the game. Um, I know. She doesn't she doesn't come often, but um, I rang her up before and I said I think you should come tomorrow. I think it'll be a good one. Um, and she said I was actually going to come and surprise you, but I didn't know what to do. Blah blah blah. So anyway, we got her over. We got her over just in time for the game. Um, I saw her briefly before it, and she was sitting in that corner where we celebrate at the end. Um, she was with my girlfriend and a few of our friends, so we just kind of had a special evening um, for her to be there and, and to see that. And she, she doesn't get to see it often, you know, so um, that was, for me, uh, on a personal level, why it was really special. And, and then just the whole kind of... Um, Whatever, wherever team spirit comes from, or whoever is the the morale that that this group has, um, you know, I, I can't put into words, but we have got something, um, we've got something in our changing room, we've got some sort of spirit, so, um, it's really special and nice on nights like that when when things fall into place, it's I mean it's great to be part of. Uh, it was really exciting, and the fans obviously enjoyed it. So, what a night, yeah. Just trying to yeah, come onto the penalty. Up. I oh, know. Go on, go on, go on, Finney. No, you crack on, Charlie. Then no, no, no. no, it's great. It's you know, it's great to hear. I mean, what an occasion it was last night, and a fair play for that penalty. I mean, I just want to, I just want to ask. I mean, did you always have in your mind you were going to step up? I mean, no one really expected it to go to to eight penalties, eight penalties each. I but did. We, oh, did you? We had to measure them. They couldn't beat us. We were like Brazil. Carry on. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, did when it came to that one, did you always on the back of mind you were gonna, you know, did you pick yourself forward? Did you get did you get the nod or did you know how did it come about you taking that penalty? No, it kind of it kind of it got because there's so many penalty takers, it kinda of got like we we're kinda of, you go next, you go, who's going next? Like, <laughs> you wanna go after him or us, you go Rob, you go and then I'll all right, now I'll go. And it was kind of a little bit like that, but before we um before we took the penalties, I kind of said, I said to UC and the gaffer, um, if I do have to hit one, which one? Like, so I've got a number. And he just yeah. said, uh, he said something like 21st or something like that. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but it, it came around and then I was, I was kind of, I was, I was feeling confident at the time, obviously. Um, but it all happened so fast. Um, yeah, and obviously the penalties were great. I mean, I think Unks got a bit lucky. Was it Unks got? Yeah, a bit... that yeah, I was a bit yeah. worried. When, yeah, there was a few seconds where I didn't think he it was going to go. Yeah, in, yeah, but... yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I disagree. I think he planned that, knowing him, so he could celebrate even more. Yeah, well, it would be like Unks to get away with it for sure. Um... <laughs> that, that did worry me though. I don't understand why the um they they oh, that one was being taken. I mean, I I couldn't really see if he moved on his line or not, but um. It was nice the referee to make sure that they, they had a second chance from my seat. <laughs> they tried their best to get Everton to win it, but Yeah, it wasn't but, um... it wasn't the first time as well in the game that there was I, I normally don't criticize the refs at all, but I thought the, the linesman and, and the ref yesterday would seem was the goal offside. Was the goal was their goal offside? I've seen a photo, yeah. It doesn't look it, I haven't I haven't watched it back, but it it does look it does look like like yeah. it does look like it was offside, yeah. The, 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 the line well, do you know what I've noticed I don't know if you two have noticed this as well tell me if I'm wrong you know when I, I can't get you to say too much here James because we don't want to get you hold in front of the powers of B and get a 20 match and duck, you know fine whatever but <laughs> I've noticed when the, a lower league team is playing a premiership side the referee like someone who like is a premiership referee like friend is on first name terms with their players and our players they don't get the same kind of like smile wink or whatever it, there does seem to be a difference did you guys notice that as well Charlie and, and, and Zed the we should have a penalty as well I can't yeah I mean I, I can't say that I, I've noticed it like I haven't like seen him like mime anything to any of the players or, or, or noticed the, the excessive friendliness or anything like that but I do think like even small things that I just think are so easy to stamp out like they took throw-ins from like third oh don't get me started on that oh my god that was horrendous it's it, just it's such a small thing but it, it's something yeah. that can get stamped out really quickly and actually if you put your your foot on it straight away they'll probably stop doing it or you'll be able to say i've warned you already and like a lot of it can be time wasting they probably back themselves with penalties unfortunately for them 
Big Jimmy's just pitting in the top corner. <laughs> <laughs> I find there was a real change last night, Jimmy and Zed and Charlie. I don't think you know this. He can watch the referee can spot a goalkeeper on his line move, but he can't spot a player grabbing the frigging ball inside the frigging earlier and not giving a penalty. Possibly the most blatant penalty you will see in ages. And he just and he was right in front of it and he just played on. These refs are amazing. I love them. But anyway. Jimmy, I don't want to get you into trouble, so I'm going to stop. But okay. what was the mood in the dressing room like after that game? Because you guys didn't want to get off the pitch for a start. Now your mother's here. That kind of makes sense a wee bit as well. Do you know what I mean? That, that must be so special. But I loved it. And I think it really gave the crowd a, a buzz last night after being robbed on Saturday. Yeah, I think I, I felt sorry for the lads with the, with the, with the last two results. Um we probably played just as good football, if not nearly better, in the two games that we lost compared to some of the ones we won. And it's so it's so difficult. Um, but I think that league's going to be like that. I don't think you're going. I don't think you're going to win them all. Um, but we will get back into a similar run to what we did at the start if we keep playing the same football that we're playing. I think that's the level of consistency we need. Um, I think some of the results can be unpredictable and, and, and there's wild referee and, and there's the pitches are changed, the atmospheres are going to change. There's, there's just things you can't control, but some of the stuff that we can control is really good. Our style of football, our team morale, like it's 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 just going to leave us in, in good stead, you know, for the, for the things that are in our control. Yeah, just... just, just I know, go on, go on. Are you sure? Yeah, go on, go on. I was just going to say... um. Like obviously watching you last night and then the other two uh, cup games, I feel like you've you've um, sort of been part of the the team in the sense of still keeping the same philosophy of playing out from the back and stuff like that. I guess my question was going to be, um, is that something that you feel like you developed through like the United Academy, or was it something that was worked on more at QPR? Without with all due respect, I'm not sure it's something you might have picked up at Burnley. So I was just wondering between the two teams there, which one? Uh, yeah, which one yeah, that? like. It's not something that was encouraged, obviously, in in my past club. It's it, not that not that there's a right or a wrong. It's just different different styles of football that are effective for different ways. I've obviously, I've been lucky enough to, when I was really young, come through a club that encouraged football, my United, and hopefully nail down some basics that that are essential. Um, equally learned very good lessons um, at Burnley um, that. Your defender first, um, so it's important to me to be able to play a common sense kind of uh, a mixed football. But but certainly coming to QPR, I've I've really had to watch the lads that were playing ahead of me, listen carefully and and try and develop the style of football. I can't just expect to go in and do my own thing. Um, we have a way of playing out from the back, and I, I do have to listen. I do have to try and develop um, that style of playing more more so than I did last season or the season before, especially being out on loan at a lot of the lower leagues and stuff where it was it was di too difficult to try and develop that side of football. I think this is probably the first time in my career where I've been encouraged to get on the ball. Um, and um, it's been <clears throat> it's been a treat for me because I've, I, I'm kind of, I can discover myself a little bit more. But, oh, actually, this is this is all right, I can do this. And I've got good players around me that can take the ball under pressure, um, so it adds a, it adds a massive value to me to my game if I can keep developing that. And I think it's a really good club to come and come and learn at. You know, it's quite difficult to to sort of go from maybe United to Burnley and then to actually make that transition back to like playing maybe a little bit more sort of out from the back and obviously not overplay, but actually just look to try and play passes rather than just sort of hit it long. I think it has. I think it has been. Uh, I've been lucky and unlucky in some ways that if, if for example, I had have maybe started out at a at a lower lower league club rather than Man United, I, I probably could have nailed down a style of football and and grown with it like that. Um, but I have had to jump through a lot of different styles and managers, and it probably, you know, most of my loan for six months, six months new club, six months new club, and I probably haven't had enough time to really really develop. Um, so the last year or two at Burnley were really good because I was in around, I was training with the first team every day, um, 
the, the standard was really high and I was I was really implementing the basics of being a defender first. Um, and this is why I'm delighted to come here on a permanent deal where I can now, I can settle and develop being a footballer as well. Um, I think it's really important. Um, and I'm getting really good coaching and I'm, I'm really grateful for as well. Yeah, how have, you, how have you settled in? How have you settled in at the club and the relationships you've got with everyone? Is there any, and as well, has there been anything about the club that's maybe surprised you? I think, I think the obvious one is is the fan base. Um, I didn't quite realise, um, like how I described it to when I was trying to describe it to my mother last night because it was one it was her second time I think at the stadium is that like I often park my car um, at my girlfriend's house and I walk to the stadium. And I kind of find myself walking out through Shepherd's Bush with all these fans. And it's like it's like the stadium's the heart of where all these people are coming from. Um, mm. It's not like a touristy club. It's like, it's nearly like a shrine for people who really care. Um, so it's, it's weird. And I, I, di I didn't understand, or I didn't ever have to understand how important it really is um, to the people in that area. Um, and maybe it's because the team are doing well at the minute and some things are going well, everyone's happy and I haven't seen the other side of it, but it, it's really taken by surprise how, how passionate and how, uh, how involved the fan base is. To be fair, we're, we're also quite mad. You have Some more than others. That. Yeah, you're mad. Yeah, yeah, you're nervous. You're nervous. You're nervous. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you see what was going on at Reading for that day, it was insane. But you're right. It, 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 and to be fair, if, if I could just sum that up a wee bit as well, the trouble is a lot of people like yourself have come over from Ireland and there's quite a few QPR fans and seldom West London and everything else. A lot of them have moved out and had to move out because of prices. So I kind of guess going back to Shepherd's Bush is that key to where they grew up where their families were and it's a possibly a big part of their past I don't know what you think about that, Charlie but I, I've certainly seen that over the years yeah I mean I'm only really young myself my dad's from my dad was born in Shepherd's Bush that's the same that sort of same thing for him where you know we live out the way we, we travel into Shepherd's Bush we go to the game he sees all his mates that he grew up with and like you say it's that it's kind of a place where everybody congregates and you just have a day out at QPR. And at the moment, it's, it's been with the cherry on the top with the performances. But yeah, it's um, like you say, it is the hub. It is the hub and it is the, the hub of the family and the community. So no, and, uh, and it's quite refreshing to hear from yourself that someone's kind of fed off that and kind of really, you know, embraced that and, and realised it. Yeah, it's noticeable. It's great. And the, the good thing is you haven't had a, look, a derby yet. Wait till we get Fulham away at Fulham. That's going to be cracking. That is going to be absolutely yeah. buzzing. So, I don't want to put any pressure on you, but if you could try one of them sticky specials for the Fulham game, that would be brilliant. Just pick it up for forty-five yards, top corner, happy days. It's that easy, like it's actually that easy. Well, Elias was telling us last week. I mean, we don't want to yeah. do the dirty obviously you know, on, on Rob, <laughs> but he was saying that when, when he when he does these in training, they tend to end up being more of a danger to the aircraft than the goalkeeper. <laughs> You can, yeah, but to be fair to Rob, it's it's actually just having the bravery to have a goal in the first place. Exactly. Like, you look great when they come off. He obviously isn't afraid of them not coming off because he does it all the time. I haven't seen him do it in training. I've only oh, seen okay. him do it. I've only seen him do it in games. It's just out of his foot, bang. I'm sure he does do it in training, actually, but... I mean, if he's working in the games, then you know, feel free to keep hitting. Tell him to hit, keep Leave hitting. Him Leave but him see, I, but this is a thing, though, Jimmy. We we were saying this last week, weren't we, Charlie? The, 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 the thing about this QPR side is just express yourself, and I think that's the best form mm. of football. It's so simple. It's it's some in some ways simple but beautiful. Not to have. We've seen a lot of QPR teams, and they seem to be playing with chains on them. I think. The manager's doing or seems to on the other side tell me if I'm wrong it's express yourself play the game enjoy yourself and the results will come yeah it's an enjoyable team to play in and and I think because of that it's an enjoyable team to watch yeah Jimmy I was going to say like staying at the back and sort of like obviously playing out and then looking at what you what you have in front of you like especially I was, I was thinking about like the game yesterday and like Ilian and Chez uh, sorry Ilian and um, Willock's uh, link up play 
it's just that I feel like every game is getting better and better. And I feel like, you know, it's against the Premier League opposition. And, and they weren't a bad side, by the way. Like, a lot of them started a lot of games last season in, in the Premier League. Yeah. And, like, I just feel like their their connection, their chemistry, it sounds like a cliche, but their their chemistry is just, like, it, it's just getting better and better. And I feel like from, from yourself at the back, you must see it and just be in awe of it a lot of the time. Just, like, the link-up play, the, the telepathy almost, just, like, the one-two touch. I just feel like it's it's relentless and they just know where each other are going to be all the time. Yeah, they're obviously, they've got a really good friendship. Mm. Um, you and, mentioned and, that. But, yeah, they know how good each other are, so they want to give each other the ball. Mm. In fact, people can, we complain about it. You know, you can pass it to other people as well. You don't have to pass it to each other. Um, but in the games, in the games, it's brilliant and it's a relief to play with players like that because it means I can just concentrate on defending and, and give the good players the ball. Um um, and and let them like even even a couple of times, Chrissy yesterday, um, we we slow build up play from the back, blah blah, and then sometimes you get Chrissy got himself in, he receives the ball in difficult pockets, um, but he takes the pressure off the whole team by just getting out of a tight <clears throat> getting out of a tight situation, having the ability to beat a man, link up with Illy, and turn the kind of transition phase from kind of a slow build up to all of a sudden win an attack. Um so it's just having them like having having players like that is special. They're 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 very gifted, they're very talented. Um yeah, I, don't, I don't think there's I don't think there's I don't care who who you are, playing against them two is a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. I mean I, this season I've been super I haven't seen too much of I unfortunately couldn't watch too many games last season. So I missed out on seeing a lot of Chris Willock. But he, he in my opinion, he's arguably been our best player this season. And him him and Ilias, as you say, like out of just small tight pockets, we're like, what are you gonna do here? And there's three people around him and just find some sort of a nutmeg or like a little gap or a little trick to try and stay on the on the sideline or something like that. And it's it's just I don't know. I'm I've been going to the games and been watching them and I'm just like in awe of the fact that We've got, and one of them's you know come through our youth system as well, which like makes it even sweeter. Um, but yeah, just to see them on a regular basis is just like, incredible. Yeah, I think that's that. I think that stuff's just un uncoachable, unteachable. I think that's just talent. They're, they're just so talented. They're so talented. Yeah. Um, just want to kind of touch when you said just coming back to your own sort of personal um, sort of aspect and team. How are you finding? Of course, you've gone from Burnley. You're, you know, we play a back four, and, and what have you you've gone to? Like a back, you know, a back three. How are you finding being that central hub when you have played with with Dicky and Barbe either side of you? How how have you find that sort of transition? How are you finding playing next to those two? It's it's definitely something you have to get used to. You can't you can't just you can't just jump into it and expect it to be fine. Mm. I've I've had to I've had to watch the lads do it in the games I wasn't playing. I've had to watch carefully, um, especially with the offsides and stuff where you are on the pitch. But I do, I do think it kind of suits me. It, it kind of, um, it gives me an opportunity to be vocal because I'm in the centre of the pitch. I can see everything. Um, it gives me the opportunity to to try and be a leader, um, and and communicate well with everyone. I, I mean, I can, I can. I'm literally me and set of course semi, but I'm in the centre of the pitch. I can see everyone. I should know everyone's job. Like for me, that's that's really enjoyable. That's that's a role that that I like. Um, I want to be vocal with everyone, and make sure everything's intact, and that helps me concentrate as well. So I really, I really enjoy that role. Yeah, it's um, great to see you've embraced it, and 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 I mean the performance last night spoke for itself. You've had the you played the full ninety minutes of the three cup games now, and your two two appearances in the league. Do you think you're kind of coming maybe close on the brink to maybe breaking into that that uh, the league side and having a bit of a run in the league? I mean that that's what I want. That's what I want. I'd, I'd like mm. to um, I'd like to have a run of games because I, I haven't had it in a while. I'd like to get my body used to being robust enough to be able to play, play, play. Like take Johan for example. Yeah. Um, he doesn't look like an absolute monster or anything like that, but he's incredibly robust. He plays, plays, plays constantly, um, and I'd like to. I'd like to have my body used to that. And the only way to get used to it is to is to do it. Is to be chucked in again. We've got a game in two days' time. I want to be chucked in again, chucked in again. Just keep playing, keep playing, and get a rhythm, um, and do that for ten years. You know. Holiday. Well, that way you're going to test it only that way, and you get the freedom of step response. You know, that's not a bad joke. Um, <laughs> I was 
I, I, I'm quite. I know I keep saying this a lot, and I'm old, but I was trying to think of songs. I, I'd say, have you had a song about you before, Jimmy, and uh, and other clubs or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had songs. Yeah, I've had. The, when when we warm up, there's a few people in the corner. I've been singing the old Richard Dunn song. Oh, uh, see, I uh, see. Have you heard of a band called the Undertones? Yeah, they're from Derry. They're from Derry. Yeah. They've got a, a song called Jimmy Jimmy. So instead of saying, we have to sing it in Northern Irish accent. So it's like Jimmy Jimmy. Oh, instead of saying Jimmy Jimmy, we Jimmy Jimmy Don. And that's as far as I got. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work on it. We'll work on it. So it needs other work. Don't and, worry, uh, your my... song doesn't rest in just Paul's hands. <laughs> please, please don't get him on a drum on a match day. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, just, you just said that because I'm from Belfast. You really like drums in Belfast. <laughs> I can see it. But it's as far as I got, I was, I was trying to work on it and I thought, oh, that could happen. That could work. And me letting a McCartney songwriting wasn't happening. I wasn't getting the creative juices going. So, um, don't worry, no Jimmy. Rush. I'll... No rush. I'll leave it with you. Uh, <laughs> I don't up. think that. I don't think that'll be your song. Anyone got any other ideas? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, do you, are you sort of opposed to the to the Richard Dunn song at the moment? I, I feel like um, people are sort of just getting to grips with it and the fact that it's sort of been um, sort of the, the new song for yourself. Is there is there anything that like you can think of from other clubs if it's uh, I guess PC enough on it to uh, to disclose or not really? I don't. I don't think I can be recommending my own songs. Yeah. There's no, 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 that can't happen. Oh no! No that question is, what do you make of Rob Dickey's song? <laughs> <laughs> Rob Dickey's my. That's my favorite song. I sing that song every day. <laughs> yeah, what, what we could say is we've got a big done stores. See what I did there, Jimmy? <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> At this point, listeners, Jimmy has his Edited. head in his hands. And regrets come on the podcast instantly. <laughs> now, um, that, that's my last joke. In fact, I'm going to knock this song lock. I don't think I'm made this jokes and song locks. But um, <laughs> no. on, on, a, on a serious note, Jimmy, how are you finding London? Yeah, I like London. I like well, I like West London because it's easy to get to training. There's plenty of coffee shops, just how I like it. And um, and you know, if you need to get into town, which I, I haven't really done much, it's it's not difficult. I'm still, I can't, the whole underground thing is not for me. I can't get to grips with the whole underground thing. Are you more a bus sort of person? I just, in Uber, like, I just, it's so straightforward. I, I just can't, the underground, where am I, like, and it's so, it, you can't breathe down there. Uh, I'll get used to it. You do after a while. I mean, it's just, it, the bit you worry at is when you're half drunk and you end up in Welland Garden City in the British Rail Line. And you can put this the journey yeah. up and you have to get back to London. That's a very interesting journey I've had a few times. So we'll let, we're going to ask one question each before you go because we, we'll take a lot of your time and we do appreciate you coming on. So my last question is, where do you want to see this? How far can this QPR team go? And who do you want in the next round which we draw on in a couple of hours? Um, Man United away. Excellent. Um... Man United away or Burnley at home or something. Um, I like play Burnley. Um, and what was your other question? Is is where, 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 where do you see this? Yeah, going this. What what do you think as a player we can achieve? I personally think top six is 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 doable despite the money that's in this league. I think we can do it. That spirit. You don't think we can get top two? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think you can, answer, but, yeah. but it, 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 it worries me, James, because, um, you know, I, I like the underdogs. I like the fact that no one's made his favourites for things and we're just getting on under the radar and just being brilliant. Don't we're listen to him. him. Automatic yeah, promotion. Yeah. Bring yeah. it home, Jimmy. Exactly. We don't want to take the risk of the playoffs. We love the top two. <laughs> I love it. By the yeah, way, I did way. say this time... I did start the start of the season. I fancied us for second place on the podcast. Just, but carry on, Jimmy. You did actually. Yeah, I remember that. Why don't you fancy us for first place? Like, but second place is so close to first place. I don't get that. <laughs> Dug another hole. <laughs> it's a good he, thing you made me does, host, Finny. I'm about to mute you. <laughs> he doesn't. He, he doesn't like me songs. He thinks I'm pessimistic. He knows me too well. This boy, I tell you. Now, that would know, be great. It'd be great. Do you know? I just, I, I didn't like, I didn't like the time we went to the Premier League before 
Jimmy, because we the club wasn't ready for it. it we splashed away too much money. And I actually um, think with the way the, the whole community thing's doing now, the, 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 the club's wised up an awful lot. I think while we have a certain fear of losing our identity and being that touristy club we don't ever want to be and stuff, there's also that wee bit that we're, I think we're more prepared for this time. And I'd love it because I think the way we're playing, the way the manager talks, the, seeing the players enjoy themselves, seeing Charlie Austin go around everyone last night, giving them a big off for the penalties now that you don't see that in many clubs. And I, I love seeing that. That means more to me than anything is seeing unity in that pitch because we haven't had it for so many years. Yeah, you know, you've, you've won me back after that. <laughs> oh, Jesus, that was a long... I'm not doing that again, I tell you. Now, nah, but you know what I mean? I mean, to be staying on teams, and I, I love the spirit we've got. I, and you can't follow that up. You can't, you can't make it happen, can you? It's, it's a kind of a organic type thing that goes on amongst players, and that spirit will take you so high as you want to be into first place, redeemed. I think, I think because of what it is that you're talking about, because we've got that, I think it'll definitely be a season to be proud of. I like. I've never been part of a championship team before, so predicting an outcome for me is just as good a guess as anything. I want to get promoted. We all want to get promoted. And there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that that's the aim. That's absolutely the aim. Um, um, so so I, I, I have no shame in, in kind of saying that. Um, but it's such early days. I think it's harder being a fan sometimes because when you're a player, you can just go... I'm playing against West Brom. I'm concentrating on West Brom. We beat West Brom. We take things. But for a fan, you can't do it in the belly. You have to constantly just watch, wait, analyze, overanalyze, and it's impossible. And then you don't want to be talked about too much. But now they're not talking about us enough, so maybe we're not in it. So it's harder being a fan, I think. I think you're um, right, and I think I'll concentrate on my songs. You're quite right, rather than focusing yeah. on games. <laughs> yeah, they're a lost cause, Vinny. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, don't, Charlie, don't focus on the song. <laughs> yeah, if only songs. I could meet you in the stadium like I can on Zoom. <laughs> Come, guys. Charlie! <laughs> Last question, Charlie. Oh, you kind of, to be fair, you kind of went on to mine. I was going to say, who do you fancy getting in the draw? Um, I wouldn't mind Chelsea at home personally, but hey, I'll carry on. Yeah, Chelsea yeah, at home all, away. All that, be, all that would be great, but I mean... Who doesn't want to mark Ronaldo? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Ronaldo down at, down at the kind of prince. One of, one of my, yeah. uh, as obviously I, I love I love QPR to death, but at the same time I, I do want to watch Messi and Ronaldo play at some point before they retire. So to get United at home or away, be a nice little trip um, up to Old Trafford to make sure. Well, I, who knows whether Ronaldo would play? But anyway, it'd be it'd be a nice trip. Uh, Charlie, if you want me to to step in and then you could ask the the final question. I'll, yeah, I'll, go for it. I'll, go for it, mate. With 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 Mark Warburton, obviously, like he's someone who comes, I think he's got a, a background in ba- in banking. He comes across as like super intelligent. I think he he comes across very well. He's very eloquent as well. Um, I was going to ask you, sort of, how how does he? We're now starting to build a, a fairly deep squad, and we have sort of positions for or secondary positions for each individual. Obviously, at the moment in the league, you haven't been able to start as much, but you've been playing more in the Cups. How has he been able to to use perhaps his EQ or like the way that he speaks to people to be able to to keep you on side? And because you obviously you're someone who's competitive and want to be wants to be playing every game as well. But how does he keep you sort of involved and like sort of passionate to be able to go on the pitch straight away? Obviously the part of it is to try and win your place, but how do you think the way that he speaks maybe gets you sort of to stay with him? Yeah, I think it's incredibly it's an incredibly difficult job as a manager to keep everyone happy. Um, and I don't think you can. I think players aren't going to be happy. I'm not happy when I'm not playing. But if you can keep them satisfied, and I, I think you can keep them satisfied, you can keep me satisfied anyway by making sure I'm still learning, I'm still being coached, I'm still really involved. And and what we have at the minute is everyone's really involved. Everyone feels like um, they matter, and and everyone's been used so far. Um, in some way so it, so everybody feels like their place is still there for the taking and that they've got a lot more to give um, I don't know I don't know how he's managed to do that or or, or how you get that as a manager but um, at the minute I, I think he has a, a, everyone feeling as though that they, they're important and, and that they've got a part to play um, 
like I say, I, I have no idea how you go about that as a manager. I think it's really difficult. Um, but for me, as long as I'm being coached and I've got a place to go to and learn every day, that's at least keeping me satisfied. Um, and it gives me something to concentrate on. So that's what I need. So I like it, bro. I think that's a tough yeah, one. Just sort of last one to, to round it off. Is it... Who's sort of the one player that maybe, you know, when you came to the club has had maybe the biggest influence for you on the pitch, off the pitch, around the training ground? Who's someone that's kind of maybe took you under, under, under their wing and, uh, you know, uh, kind of been there for you and helped you sort of settle in the club? Who's kind of been that, that player or has there been a few? Oh, it's a good question. It's a good question. Um, I have made some really good, some really good friends. Um, obviously, me and Sam and Callum signed at the same same time, so um, and we didn't know anyone, so we would go we would go for uh, uh, lonely Nando's dates together, and uh, and me and me and Sam helped each other settle in, um, but uh, but you've got natural leaders in the group. Now that I think about it, one that I really enjoy speaking to. Who's, who's really interesting his concepts in football? A bit of a football genius is Lee Wallace. Um, uh, a lot of people are saying that. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. He's very interesting. It's hard to describe. Without saying he's weird, he's interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I really What's enjoy. Thinking, right, dogs? Jimmy, is he super uh, analytical? Is that is that what it is? Or yeah, he's super analytical. He's one of these people who, um, do those people who ask why to everything? Why? <laughs> well, like yeah. a little kid. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know what I mean? And like even recently, for example, we come in every morning and we kind of spot each other. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, good. And it, it's become this kind of like autopilot. Yeah, good morning, you. And uh, one morning I come in. Uh, morning, Lee. Uh, morning, Jim. Uh, how are you? Yeah, good. Yeah, you. Yeah, good. And he went, why are you good? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I went. I don't, well. I don't know if I'm. I don't know if I'm good. I just say good. But he said, "Well, like, are you even good?" He's a deep. Uh, oh, here we go, Lee. I'll, I don't care, Lee. It's eight, half eight in the morning, like. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but he's really interesting. He's got he's got really views and good views in football and stuff. So uh, I enjoy learning off him, and obviously he's had a, a really good career so far. So I really enjoy learning off Lee, and there's loads of them like that, Steph. Um, has a voice. Charlie certainly has a voice, um, and and there's there's loads of people who have been there and done that to learn off. And and I've I've also made in the group some really good some really good friends. There's a lot of culture in the group. People from different places, which is great. So I feel like, given how many people have said that about Lee Wallace, I feel like he must be like a nailed on manager after he retires because it sounds like he's, he's he like, has to be he has to be yeah yeah yeah. But why would you say that? <laughs> the thing that I just did why? that is, 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 is why? Why? So anyway, when you have to explain it, Finny, it doesn't work. I, <laughs> I got I, it though. I, I got it. I got it. I got it. I've, I've been explaining things for 52 years of this goddamn life. I can tell you. Right, James, we've took way too much of your time. Um, keep doing what you're doing, big man. Keep learning and keep driving towards being uh, a Queens Park Rangers legend. And um, following, you're following in some great footsteps, big man. And thank you for that penalty last night. I don't care what anyone says. I didn't find I wouldn't have fancy taking one of them. And you did it with grace and decorum and you didn't go mental at all. Although did you notice quickly before I let him go? Sorry guys. We earlier did he got licked by Stuart as he came back on the pitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Stuart. You've not seen the photos. Him. Have we got a video of that? Oh, there's, a, there's photos I, of it. There's two stewards. I'll send, I'll send it to you. I'll, I'll send you your email. I'll send you your email oh, after the phone. Oh, really? Please send me a piece. That's hilarious. Yeah, really. Oh, <laughs> Honestly, I think it was. I think he was going for your autograph, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but James, seriously, thank you ever so much for coming on the podcast. I wish you all the best at Queen's Park Rangers. You're exactly what we need, fella. And um, well done last night. Hopefully, we'll get someone in the next round, and then someone after that, and get to Wembley. Absolutely. No pressure. That's the plan. Thanks very much, guys. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much, James. Keep we look forward to, to boating round Finney's chant. So, uh, yeah, that'll no, be good. <laughs> <laughs> All the best, mate. See you, mate. See you. Bye now. Great. I don't know what you guys thought, but wow. What?
there's a there's an old head and young shoulders there, big man, isn't it? Like it's just yeah. the way he's speaking and learning, and because you get a lot of players that come on and I guess they're just like, I want to be the first day, I want to be the first day. He's actually staying the bigger picture, which I guess is a hard thing to do. When you've been at Man U, then you've gone to Burnley, and then you come to keep going for thing. Why well, should you be the first team? Mm-hmm. I like his attitude. There's yeah, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, he's, he's got a future. I think there's a couple of things there. I think the first thing is that I'm really impressed by his sort of like work in progress mentality, as you touch on there, and like the fact that he's he's willing to improve. He wants to sort of like learn things all the time, and like yeah, he's 23. Yes, he's young, but a lot of people, as you say, from those sorts of academies, they they don't have they they think that they've made it, and they you know they come here so not for a payday unless they're sort of like. Well, we've we've seen a few paid people in the past. But, um, yeah, I think I think obviously a lot of them come in. They might think that they know it all, but the fact that he's got this open mind to try and to take on new advice and stuff like that's a big thing. But I, I think also the second thing is there must be a big testament to to Mark Warburton because I think whilst fine, yeah, he seems very grounded. I think the fact that he's he must be speaking to him in in the manner that would make him want to take on this this sort of advice and and actually w- want him. He's going to want to listen to him as a result, I think. So I think a lot of credit has to probably go to, to the, the backroom staff as well, I reckon. Sure, yeah, I, I think, you know, last night, I think we saw, we got a glimpse of the character that we've just sort of seen this evening. Um, it very much surprised me when he stepped up to the penalty last night. Both me and my dad, I mean, we were sitting on the complete, you know, in the, the upper loft that is the other end of the stadium. We thought at first it was Rob Dickey taking the penalty and we had a closer look. And it was, in fact, um, Jimmy. So, um, you know, he had a fantastic performance last night. And then to go and do that and step up and, and get the winning penalty just kind of was testament to his character. And I think, you know, he, he's, you know, he spoke so well tonight, but he's also putting those actions in, into, uh, sorry, putting those words into action. And like I said, it was when he kind of said about how, you know, he's not happy because he wants to play, but he's satisfied as long as he's learning, as long as he's involved then he can deal with that and he will get his chance. So, no, I think it's another great signing by the club. It's another one where they've not only signed a great player, a great player, they've signed a great person that someone wants to buy into the cause. So, very refreshing to see what we had to say tonight. And um, can only wish him for the best and look forward to seeing him back out there again. Yeah. Well, but because we've had two very, very, very good guests on tonight, I'll be honest with you, we're going to have to kind of touch over the last two games very quickly, probably just go around it very fast. Yeah. Um, no pressure, because otherwise... We'll be going on for the longest podcast known to man since the last time I was doing an hour's end. Um, Mr. Songjay, what would you say was the difference between the game on Saturday and last night? And are you overall pleased with how the outcome was last night and obviously not Saturday? Saturday's game? What was Saturday's game? Um... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Mr. Q, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's got three shirts behind him. He's got another result with that. Um, nah. So involved by Everton. <laughs> I think um, so. The Bristol City game at, at home. I think it, it yes. was. Yeah, got me. Got it me. was. Uh, I, so I wasn't there. Unfortunately, I was. I was playing football. I played football on Saturdays as well. So it's difficult to be able to get to a lot of home games. But I try and go sort of, especially midweek as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think having watched it back on on the on the website and the full ninety, I think it, I was having this conversation with Josh, and I think. I'm just I'm hoping that the players don't get too disheartened because I think obviously the result against Bournemouth probably should have got at least a point. Uh, the game against Bristol City we should have probably won like within the first sort of 60, 70 minutes and put it to bed. But and these chances need to be taken. So I, I just don't want them to get too disheartened by the fact that you know these these chances don't seem to be going in. Obviously, it's stuff that you can work on finishing, etc. But I think the fact that you know they are coming and that the, the goals are coming, the chances are coming, is probably a good thing. Um, we saw we saw again against Premier League opposition last night, we can score two, probably could have potentially scored more. They could have potentially scored more too. It was a fairly even game on balance. I think we were better in the first half, but perhaps they were better in the second half. I think against Bristol City, it was obviously pretty dominant throughout. But I, I think if you ask me, if, I think maybe Charlie said this as well, but given it's like such a last week, I think given it's, it's such a long season, I think to beat Premier League opposition, you know, the first time we got to round four in the first in the last 13 years, um, at that point, I think it was against Villa as well in 2008. So that sort of memory will probably live long, especially because it was a shootout as well. Um, a game against Bristol City, yes, of course, we should have got three points. Unfortunate not to get that, but I think we'll be challenging. I'm, I'm all but certain we'll finish in the top 10 and I reckon we've got a really good chance of getting the top six. 
Um, so, I mean, I, I would take it, I think, with hindsight. And obviously, we've got a big game against West Brom. It's probably the boost that we needed as well to sort of have that extra confidence of actually we've beaten a Premier League team. These guys have just come down from there. Their squad versus Everton's that they put out last night, probably not too too different in terms of quality. Arguably, Everton's was better. So, again, it should take we should take comfort and, and solace in the fact that, you know, we've got that result last night. Spot on. Mm. Spot on. Yeah, the uh, 20 Bristol City, Charlie. In the, Bristol City. Yeah, you're right. It's come to me now. I just need a little refresher. I've talked about Everton for so long. That's the thing that, that, you know, games just fly by you so quickly in this league. It's hard to keep up. But um, yeah, what a, what a game that was. Um, 26 shots. That second half, I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. Bristol City had mm. near enough every man behind the ball for the second half. And, and of course, it had to be. Had to be that man that as soon as he was running through, you just I, I looked away. I just knew he was going to score. But um, you know, at points in that game, we we just seemed to be just trying to walk the ball into the back of the net, and it was just like someone just we got into good areas, and it's just someone just pulled the trigger. We saw it in the first half. Stefan Johansson got in a good area outside the edge of the box. He pulled the trigger, good shot on target. Keeper pushed it home for a corner. You got a chance there, but you know, we just you know. I know it's our style of play and nice intricate passing around the you know, edge of the box. When you've been doing it for, it's getting to 70, 80 minutes on the clock. You've had all these chances. You had all this possession and you still not really tested the keeper that much. You've got to do something different. And it was just like, it was very, very frustrating. I'm sure we all find it very frustrating, but um, you know, we responded unbelievably well against Everton. Um, I, I don't know. It's quite interesting. I was saying this to my dad the other day and it was like, you know, we seem to do so well against these Premier League sides that, you know, kind of play the game at a different sort of pace of the championship and sort of allow allow others, the other side, the opponent to have more time in the ball. And it's kind of like, you know, it'd be interesting to see, I don't know this is completely getting onto another dimension here, but it'd be very interesting to see how he would actually perform with that style of play in the Premier League compared to, you know, how we're doing in the, in the championship. But um, yeah, it was such a refresh. I mean, the first half was just phenomenal against Everton. Um, some individual performances, but I think everybody on that pitch was just fantastic. It was the intensity, uh, the preciseness and sort of the the accuracy of the passing was just so intricate. Um, everyone was on the same wavelength. The movement on and off the ball was tremendous. And it all just seemed to really click in that first half. It's a shame about the goals, but a really, really enjoyable game. And, you know, like I say, and like as you touched upon, it, it's given us that right kick up the backside now where, you know, the morale, the confidence, we're just dropping off a little bit and maybe starting to question ourselves and our ability. But now we've done that against Everton. Um, we'll be flying into it at West Brom on Friday. And, and like I say, our back has to get a result now. I couldn't agree more. I mean, Saturday was a fluke. I mean, I don't care what anyone says. You know, I know some people say, well, this shouldn't happen, that shouldn't happen. It happened. We had so much of the ball, so many shots. Their keeper, what I think our biggest the win against us was he had a nightmare the previous game, apparently, and he, he got a right rollicking. So he came into that game from a rollicking from Pearson and decided to turn into Gordon Banks for the evening, uh, for the <laughs> afternoon, sorry. And um, yeah, it worked. And he, you know, he, he, he done his job. We should have took more chances, of course, to shoot. But at least they're trying and they're not hiding. You know, I'd rather see a QPR side do that. And it's interesting as well to see because after a Bristol City result a couple of seasons ago, that side would have crumbled. It would have gone into its shell. It would have been looking at its feet. Um, and we didn't do that. Even with, against Everton last night, we didn't lose sight of the fact that we had them. We were, we were meeting them. And almost more than that, Willick was causing them so many problems. Even... Benitez was just sort of looking at it like, what do we do with this fella? How do we stop him going down these alleyways, coming out the other side and, and putting square balls through? Ilias was playing really well. I mean, we did, I felt we really did put them under last night and, and we, we held their head high and, and they were trying as well. Everyone did just turn up and, and make the numbers up. They wanted to win that match. But Bristol City, it's just a shame because, you know, they didn't deserve to lose it, but we have. But there's so many games, like you said, they're thick and fast. Go to West Brom, did a good result. Breathe a bit after the last few fixtures. See what comes out of the hat tonight in the cup, and then just keep like you might, as as Jim, Jim's Jim said, Jimmy, just keep going, keep going for the next game, and just keep the result. There's no reason why we can't go as far as we want this league. And another day we'll beat Bristol City seven nil. Just wasn't to be. Right, yeah. we're, we're going to do ours end, and I'm going to keep mine very short. And I'm going to go first because 
I'm kind of hosting, and I'm probably doing it terribly. And if if you want to send your 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 complaints in, please do so. I'm I'm ready for them. Um, I'll just give them to somebody else who can read them. Um, I felt last night was a return to the old QPR. I I love seeing the League Cup with a full ground, more or less, with a lots of people there, not so many empty seats, proper under the lights atmosphere. It was beautiful. And anyone that didn't come away from that game last night for not for another football is mad. It was beautiful. And there was so much to love. And um, yeah, that's why we love this football club. It gave you everything and more. Well, um, Charlie, do you want to go? I need to still think about mine, I think. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to Stephen Duke McKenna. I thought when he came on last night, he was absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, he, he came on and he was, he, he was, his work rate was in, infectious. It gave the side a great boost coming in with some flying challenges. And I, I, I mean, I, I don't know how tall he is, but he doesn't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie and say, I think he's the tallest bloke on the pitch, but there was one where he went up for a header and he must've jumped about, about three times his height. I um, mean, he was mm. on the head. <laughs> it was, uh, it was phenomenal. And then and not only that, that, yeah, not only, not only his performance, I know albeit it was only for, about 15 minutes or 20 minutes he came on um and then he then stepped up and took the penalty in in a sudden death situation with um knockout lo- you know in a knockout situation i thought I, I thought the the confidence um in himself and the bravery was just uh, just makes me speechless i would, could not have expected it from any young player um and that is a testament to himself you know, the culture that's been created by the academy that we talked about tonight, the management. And I think it's just, I was really refreshing last night, I think. And especially, with, you know, Jimmy Dunn as well, but he's had a few more chances. But for, for the young player to step up like that, no no shame and just and hit it, you know, straight into the back of the net. Fair play to him. His, his, cam- thing- Sorry, I was just his cameo appearance is a really decent spell, by the way. Like, yeah. he had a like, flick around the corners, sort of like pressing people, winning headers sort of really hassling, like causing pressure against opponents and stuff. I think it was really impressive. I think, um, sorry, Finney, what were you going to say? I was just going to just come on to that quickly. I, I like the way the, the lads pushed him forward at the end as well to get his applause because yeah. it was bloody, what he did last night to guts in that penalty yeah. and well played that fella. Back to you, Z. Yeah, I, I just say, I think probably my R's end is sort of on, in a similar vein. I think, whilst I don't think his performance was exceptional or anything I think the fact that you know Luke Amos has come off like a really lengthy injury and I think the yeah. fact that he's, he's come in he also took a penalty he also scored I think that yeah. obviously takes a lot of guts and I think obviously it, it's the return that perhaps he wanted and maybe envisaged in his head um, so it's, it's nice to sort of see him back and I, I think you know Robertson backs him a lot and I know a lot of fans are a bit 50-50 on him or whatever but I think you know there's work that's been done on all of these players in the last 12 to 18 months, 24 months. And I think the fact that he's not been there means that we could see a lot of progression in the last, in the next sort of few months um, in terms of the way that he plays, the way that he's reading the game, you know, trying to find pockets and stuff like that. Um, what, what my R's end was going to be was just mainly on um, just making sure that we stay behind the lads. I think it sounds very cliche, but I think at the moment things are going very well. Um, there will be a time, perhaps like in the last couple of league results and stuff, if things do start to go a little bit further than just a couple, hopefully they don't. But if they do, I think it's important not to try and single out too many people. I think there's been a lot of stick towards like Ozzy Kakai. If I'm being honest, I I think he has a lot to work on in his game. I'm not sure that he's ready for this level. However, he's someone that's not only one of our own, but he's a professional footballer and a human being who needs support. And at the end of the day, you know, he's not doing this on purpose. Like if he's playing badly, he knows he's going to be playing badly because not only is our people in the, in the backroom staff going to be telling him or trying to help him improve, but him as a professional, if he's modest enough, will be able to know that he's, you know, misplaced a pass or whatever. So I think it's important for individuals like himself, perhaps Luke, Luke Amos as he comes to full fitness and like sort of maybe makes cameo appearances here and there. I think it's important that we stay behind them and not to sort of ridicule them because it becomes it becomes a self-fulfilling pro- prophecy in the sense that, you know, he doesn't want to be playing badly, but then there's no confidence towards him. So then he, may- he plays worse and then it can just keep snowballing. So, you know, it-, it can somewhat ruin careers and it can definitely ruin like stints at a club. So I think we need to just be a bit cautious about that personally. 
Well can said. Agree more. Well said. Can agree more. Right. Predictions, Charlie. Um, hot on my head. Um, I'm going to go for two two. Two two. We get a point on the road Friday night under lights. Okay. West Brom. Two two. Okay. I'll I'll take that all day long. Yeah. Is that so will I. What are you thinking? <sighs> Again, like whole head, but I'm just gonna give one one result as opposed to doing it separately. Um, I, I'm gonna hope. I'm hoping that despite it being on TV, and obviously we all know about how poorly we are on TV. Having said that, we've not been too bad. You know, came back two 0 down against Barnsley, beat Ox, um, beat sorry Leighton Orient in the cup. So I don't know. Maybe things are changing. Let's see. Touch wood. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm hoping that given that they're they're the home side, they've they've probably got big expectations. Um, obviously on TV that everyone's expecting them to win. I'm hoping we sort of go there as underdogs, still play our football, catch them on multiple counter-attacks and win 2-1. So uh, that's m- going to be my prediction. I like that okay. one. I like it. <laughs> you know what? He, he's on again. He is definitely on again. Right. I think I'm going to wrap up this ever so long podcast with my prediction, which I think we, I kind of believe I'm going to go for both of you. So I, think I can see us either get a 2-1 or a 2 all. And I'm going to sit in the fence. But as long as we just keep doing what we're doing, I'll be as happy as Larry, whatever happens. Just, just keep playing and don't hide. That's all you can ask. Right. This has been a rather long podcast. Thank you, dear listener, for bearing with us. It's been much appreciated. But if anyone's silly, I'll be amazed. <laughs> ah, yeah. If you, if, you, if you haven't switched off and put it on the news, thank you for not doing that. But I'll tell you what, what, thanks as well to Alex and Jimmy Don. I mean, I, both were incredible, but Jimmy Don just... Uh, he's, he's made me smile more than I thought I would do interviewing anyone. He's just <laughs> so honest, and I love that in a player. Um, in fact, him and Cher, who have both, I think, been outstanding for the club in how they, they, they come across. As well, yeah. Oh, I, I, I don't know what we're going to do next week, but I'm going to watch how we live up to that. Yeah. yeah I just, got, I just, got, just got to tell you this quickly, right? This is between us, like, I, I'm going away a couple of days and I screwed up. I thought the Birmingham match was a Wednesday and it's not a Tuesday. So um, I'm missing that. What an idiot! Ooh, Who does that? Really? So, yeah. And uh, like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just, yeah. Oh well, I go. I'm always, I'm crap at organising things. I'm an embarrassment to myself. We've had quite a few nice away days in in Birmingham for in the last few years as well. I remember Yeni and Bakoto. I remember like a bright oh, score yeah. as well. So we tend to do all right over there. So, yeah, this, is, this is at Rangers low, so I'm just rubbing it in at the moment. Too bad, you know, I feel like a shot. I, I'll take that on board. Well, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully next week we come back three more points. And Charlie, been brilliant, Mister Z, as I'm going to call you now, absolutely amazing. Because um, Mister Stumjay just seems so formal, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, it makes us sound like a school teacher. Yes, you don't even write <laughs> Mister. Just Z is cool, no problem. <laughs> Good man. And listen, I, I've enjoyed this podcast. Thank you both very, very, very much. And look after yourselves and see you both soon. And yes. thanks everyone for listening. You can find us on all usual outlets of this podcast and keep supporting that we do appreciate it. Thanks a million. Thank you.